Hey, today, guys, we're finishing up a series we've been doing now for, uh, for, for several months. You know, we have this thought of whatever it takes, you know, it's just this, you know, and, and we have a little title of, of whatever it takes. And I found out that, again, as we kind of walk through this, uh, what I want to share with you today is just, is just a, is basically kind of a picture from Jesus's life and kind of an encounter he had and that just kind of what you and I can learn from that. And I think you'll be amazed when you see some of this. It's a, it's a very well-known story in Christ's life. This is his encounter with the woman of Samaria. It's, kind of, it's commonly known as the woman at the well, whichever. But there's so much in this passage, right? So much in this passage, there's no way I can cover it all. But the main thought I want to today to talk about is, is, uh, is basically Jesus is explaining the message with this, with this woman. You'll get it in just a second. But in case you're new with this or a guest, we have been, we've been in this series, whatever it takes, that is, whatever it takes to do what he's called us to do. And, and we've been in the series to where, where we've been talking about you and I's responsibility if we're his. And, and when you think about the responsibility we have to not only to be who we're supposed to be, uh, but to do what he's called us to do. And so, and within this, you know, within this, within this incredible, incredible, incredible responsibility is this thought of that when Jesus, we talked about this a few weeks ago, Jesus said that, follow me. And he said, then I will make of you fishers of men. So those that are his, I've said this every week, those that are his, truly his, I'm not talking about just religious or whatever this, but those who are truly his, that you will be, you will want to be a part of, of, of what we're doing here because Jesus said, follow me and I will make of you fishers of men. So therefore, if he is within, he is at work within to, to, to make us this, this metaphor of being a fishers a fisher of men. So this is kind of what we've been talking about over the weeks. We've, we've, we put together, you know, in our own lives, uh, through a series of things that we've done, just lists of people we've been praying for. And it's been really neat to hear from a lot of you about what has been happening and those type things. And so, and so we're going to continue. We've got a lot of cool things that are coming up. Uh, we have, uh, obviously the, we have different things that with the, with the Christmas musical and different things. I'll share with you a little bit of that in just a minute as we, as we end. But what I want to talk with you today is this thought of living water, right? Jesus used this analogy, right? And so I titled it living water. Uh, but in reality, I could have titled it several, several things. One thing, if you know the story, uh, I almost titled this today uh, a question, are you thirsty? right? Are you thirsty? And that gets across as much of what Jesus is trying to say here. Because when you, when you get, Jesus is using an analogy of how you and I have a need for water. And it's a constant thing. You can have water and it fills that need, but it doesn't ever truly quench that need. And then Jesus uses this for something else as, 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 as that which is within and how are you created and different things. So you're gonna see something within this story that, that is a powerful thing in helping us understand how this whole thing works. It comes from an encounter Jesus had. I've talked about this several times. And, uh, and this, the living water that Jesus references here, I wanna go ahead and tell you that there, it's another play on words that Jesus is using. Because I didn't, believe it or not, I never knew this until I went over to the, into Israel, the Holy Land for the first time. And actually we were standing at a place uh, called En Gedi. And uh, En Gedi was a place uh, in the Old Testament that uh, several things happened there, but David wrote several of his Psalms at En Gedi. En Gedi was, in a, was an oasis. It was a, it's actually, if you've ever been, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's this huge waterfall, right? Now, when I say a waterfall, it's out in the middle of a desert. I mean, seriously, it, it's dry and arid. And yet right out here in the middle is this place called En Gedi. And there's this huge waterfall that drops probably 50 feet. And, and uh, we were out there and, and our, our, our guide, was Jewish, and she said, well, that's living water. And I was almost looking back at her like, 
you know, but that was the term, that was a, a word they used for water that ran, right? Running water. Uh, as the being the best kind of water. It's alive, it's running, all right? It moves. Well water is the next best, and then a cistern where you just catch water, and, you know, and it kind of grows on you. Yeah, I know, like a pond. If you've like pond water, I mean, it'll keep you alive, but not the best. The running is the best. So it's called living water. So Jesus, in this little story, uses that play on words. And I just wanted you to know that before we jumped into it. All right, let's jump into it, and let's see how it works, all right? Uh, number one is a meeting with a woman, all right? When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had, uh, had already heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that is John the Baptist. Although Jesus himself did not baptize, right? But only his disciples. He left Judea and he departed again for Galilee. Now, just so you understand that, that thought there, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. I just don't have time to cover everything. But a little bit of the background is simply this. If you understand that, that at this particular time, uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, was just a tiny little piece of land, and it basically was broken up into three, let's call them states. We have 50 states, they had three. The bottom one was called Judea, the middle one was called Samaria, and the, and the northern one was called Galilee. And now Jesus grew up in Galilee, you know, with the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum and Nazareth, obviously, where he grew up. All that was in the north. Uh, in the south, it was much more dry. That's where Jerusalem was. So it was kind of the economic hub, the political hub, the religious hub. And so the northern part was more the agricultural, that kind of a thing. So, so what does it say here that Jesus heard that the Pharisees had heard that he was, you know, making more disciples? You have to remember the Pharisees and the religious leaders of, of their day. They didn't want to give up power because you have to remember religious power at the time was it. I mean, if you had religious power, you had all kinds of power, political power and everything else. And, and these Pharisees and the religious leaders, they were after John the Baptist because he'd gotten popular, right? People were listening to him. Well, now that Jesus got more, was getting more popular, if you will, they were going to turn their sights on him. So Jesus knew his time wasn't yet, so he headed back to the northern part. Okay. Now, just so you understand how this works, okay? you have the southern state and the northern state. Those that lived in those two places, they were Jewish, purely Jewish. But through the many wars and conquering and different things, the middle state, Samaria, Gentiles had kind of been put into that area, that is non-Jewish people, and they had intermarried with the Jewish people. So they were not purely Jewish in Samaria. So the people in the south and the people in the north, there was a huge prejudice problem, right? And they, they really didn't speak to one another. They wouldn't have anything to do with one another, especially the Jewish people toward the Samaritans. And if you've ever been prejudiced against, you know it's a real fight not to be prejudiced back. Okay, so that's the whole situation of what was happening here. Now, Obviously, Jesus didn't care anything about any of those things. And, uh, and look at verse four. And he, that is Jesus, had to pass through Samaria. Now, you have to remember at the time is that people, people, they just really didn't like, the Jewish people really didn't like the Samaritans. And so they wouldn't even pass through their country. They would, they would cross over the river, go around their country, and cross back over if you wanted to go to Galilee. Does that make sense? You'll see it in just a minute. It's, a, it, it's an ugly thing. It happens. It always still happens, obviously, today. So he, he went straight north all the way through Samaria. And he came, he came to a, a town uh, of Samaria called Sychar, and near uh, the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Guys, that well is still there today, okay? It is one of the most authentic places over there. It has been around for literally, I won't even say hundreds of years, but thousands of years. Uh, this one real authentic place. So anyway, Jesus had weird, it says there, Jacob's well, Jesus, wearied by his journey, right, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, in this particular time, you and I count, uh, we count our day from midnight, 
Our day begins at midnight. But the time of Jesus, they, they started the next day by usually at six o'clock in the morning is that was what we're talking about. So the sixth hour was right noon, right? High noon. So Jesus had probably been traveling several hours straight north, right? And he'd come across this little town. He'd stop by a well, right? And, uh, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water, right? And Jesus said to her, could you give me a drink? Right? So we have this chance meeting and w what's given us is, a, is quite a bit. There's a lot to this story. It's pretty cool. As you, as you kind of can eavesdrop in on a conversation Jesus had uh, with a woman in Samaria, right? And you'll see kind of how it unfolds. But since I've shared with you a little bit, you'll see some other things too, All right? Number, number two, number two. Number one, just the meeting she, that, that Jesus had with her. Number two is Jesus gives her an illustration to help her understand what her need is, right? And that's huge. When you understand your need, right? When you get some truth about not only who you are, but the great need that you and I have, it really helps things come into perspective. So, so Jesus goes into and explains to her about her need. But first of all, you'll see how, how he gets to it. All right, let's take a look at it. So a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said, hey, could you give me a drink? And for the disciples had gone away into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, all right, all right, how is it that you, being a Jew, asks me, ask for a drink from me, who's a woman of Samaria? So you already see the problem this woman's picking up on, almost kind of like, I can't even believe you're speaking to me, much less asking me for a drink. Now, this is interesting, right? Look at the parentheses, all right? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, this is, it's interesting because it's real hard to translate that phrase. It's translated for Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans, but it actually comes from a, <laughs> From a, from a thought of uh, basically what that word really is, it's, it's broken dishes. And you're going, broken dishes. That's how they translate it for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And here was the thought, right? And so it became known as something else. Uh, it became known as the Jews don't deal with Samaritans. And broken dishes, what it meant was, obviously the greater majority, only the most wealthy had you know, metal or silver type dishes, right? Or, or, or cups. Most of them were made, you know, it was like pottery, right? Like they were made of clay, you know, and they, they would form them on a potter's wheel and they would fire them and, and glaze them and other things like that. But they were porous. And so what would happen is, is that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans so much that if a, if a Samaritan drank out of a cup or ate off of a plate, they would break the plates or cups. No, not even wash them. Nope, nope, nope. That's how ugly it was, right? That's how ugly, pre, pre, there's no room for prejudice. Zero among God's people, zero, right? And, and, and again, I, I come to the point where I wonder if, if you truly can understand that if you're a believer in Christ, is who we are in him. Obviously, there was tons of prejudice at Jesus' time, right? But Jesus never gave way to any of it, right? And so this is, he's, he's having a conversation with this woman, and this woman is shocked that, she's even, that he's even talking to her, right? right? So let's continue here, right? And then Jesus decides to engage her in a conversation to help her understand God's word to her, right? The message of the gospel. And he goes on to say, if you knew the gift of God, all right, and who it is that's talking to you, all right, saying to you, hey, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Now that's a mouthful, all of that's a mouthful. But Jesus said, hey, listen, if you understood God's gift, which just means grace, a grace is a gift you don't deserve and yet God gives to us anyway. And so Jesus makes this statement, if you understood God get, God's gift, which we find out and we know, obviously, from reading the scriptures, is who he is and then what he came to do, right? We are going to be really celebrating here in the next month or so about God's gift to us in his son, right? Christ is the greatest gift ever given. But he was, he was an incredible gift, not only because of who he was, but what he was going to do. And that's what he is about to tell this woman. 
It's, it's more in illustrative mode, right? But for those who have ears to hear, right? This is what, this is what we're talking about, right? So, so basically, so basically having this thought of, hey, listen, if you know what this gift was, all right, you would be asking me for a drink and I would give you living water. So now that I've already told you about the living water, Jesus is using an illustration, right? He's using a a metaphor, one thing that really represents something else, symbolism. But she doesn't catch on. She thinks that he's talking about that he has a superior water, actual water. Well, she takes offense. Usually people that are prejudiced against one another, they get offended real easy. Well, she takes offense. Let's see what she says, all right? She says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well's deep. Where are you going to get this living water, all right? And here's where she begins. She says, are you, are you greater, right, than our father Jacob? You hear what she's saying? So you're trying to say that your water is better than this well's water because do you know that Jacob is the one who dug this well and gave this well to us, right? Now, this is classic stuff, absolutely classic stuff. I tell you what, if anything, humans down through the history have been extremely superstitious, right? Just because Jacob dug that well, does it make that water any better than any other water? No, you know, I've been over the Holy Land lots of times and I watch people and there's nothing wrong if you want a souvenir or something, but you can, you can dip out a whole gallon of Jordan River water. And let me tell you what, it is water, right? Nothing, nothing special about it, nothing magical about it, nothing magical about this. And somehow we think that and through all of that, but what she's really taking offense to is her, is her you know, if you will, reverse prejudice toward, for, toward Jesus because she'd been so prejudiced against. Is it, you know, who do you think you are, basically? You think, you're, you think you're greater than our father Jacob? He's the one that gave us this well. You think your water's better than his, right? And that he even drank from it himself. Ooh, right? Right? I've told you the story about it. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was a story of a church in Washington D.C. and 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 basically, if you come down to a pew, I've told you this before, but I just want you to see how bad humans are about this. You may struggle with this too. Superstitiousness, as if this means something. It means nothing, right? But there was this uh, this uh, this church in. Um, Peter Marshall went to be the pastor there. You see, when he got there, he says, he looked out and on the fourth row or third row, there was this big glassed in case right over to his left, big glassed in case. And nobody was allowed to see it because it was a big, it was glassed in, right? It was this big square. And there was a little plaque on it, right? Which is the death nail to any church is a plaque. And uh, there was a plaque on it said that Abraham Lincoln worshiped here. And, I, and, and it was interesting because Peter Marshall said, I don't think anybody worshiped there since. <laughs> is that, is that make, making sense? Did it make that chair any more important? No. Did it really mean anything? No. But I don't know why as humans we think it does. I just don't know why we get to superstitiousness. And I've watched people over in the Holy Land with all this stuff, but that's the way this woman was, right? That's the way she was. She just somehow put all this stuff together and, and you make something up as you go, which is what the Samaritans did. We'll get to that in just a minute. Again, there's so much to this passage, I don't have the time, but I do want you to see a little bit of it. So basically saying, listen, you realize Jacob drank from this well and that all of his sons drank from this well. Now, who were his sons, all right? They were the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Judah and Levi and Joseph, all right? Benjamin. Uh, of course, Joseph's two sons became the tribes, but but that was a big deal, right? And they don't know why she threw in that, that Jacob's cows and goats drank from it, livestock, but she did. And Jesus says to her, okay, you're not getting what I'm telling you. Hey, he, says, he basically says this, everyone who drinks this water, 
right, is going to get thirsty again. And then G Jesus lets her in on what he's talking about. Listen to this, this is powerful. He says, but whoever drinks the water that I'm going to give them, all right, will never be thirsty again. All right? In fact, the water I give him will become where? In him. All right? We're not talking about just constant water you always get to get. We're talking about the well, getting water out of a well. We're talking about the putting the well within. This is Jesus' words. It says, the water I'm gonna give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Therefore, it will be a permanent solution, right? Now she doesn't get this, but this is some kind of an illustration, right? What she's getting him to, un what, she, what he is getting her to understand is this concept of thirst. When you and I can get this concept of thirst, and let me tell you this, I'll go ahead and tell you right over, nobody likes to talk about this, right? Nobody likes to talk about this because nobody's got a good answer. And it's this concept of meaning, purpose, right? People think, uh, well, when you start talking that way, it's, you know, you just get into philosophical gobbledygook, and a lot of times they're right. But we all know that this is one answer. This is what Jesus is addressing. He's addressing this, this thing of purpose, this thing of what is it about us that is thirsty? And he's not talking about physical thirst, but he's using it as an analogy for the inside. What is it about you and I, right? That everything we get never truly satisfies. Right? No matter what our goals are, no matter what we achieve, whether we achieve a whole lot or don't achieve anything, this is one thing that keeps following us around. This idea of thirst, right? This idea of, of that Christ says he has an answer to it. This need in here. And we attempt to fill it with all kinds of stuff. Only the very young realize, excuse me, don't realize yet, right? That there isn't something actually out there that fills that. Now, I've told you, I've told you before, but it's, it's, it, it happens like this, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's a kid who wakes up, you know, on Christmas morning, and he just really wants this brand new bicycle, and, and or whatever it is, new computer, you know, let's update it, whatever. But, but there's this thought of, if I ever had that bicycle, I would never want anything else again, right? Now, you get him the bicycle, and you know what he finds out? Okay, it's not near as cool as he thought it was. In fact, it may have been cool for a little while, but it begins to wane. So you find out that that's not what you're looking for, so you move on to something else, right? The toys get bigger, the toys get expensive, but it's the same process. You get it and it doesn't measure up. Disappointment follows and you begin to ask yourself the question, golly, what can it be? And then again, it just move, it moves up, you know, if I can just do this, if I can just get into this, you know, educational program, if I can just get this job and you know, or I know what it is, it's the right person. I need to find the right person. You know, husband, wife, whatever, a girl, guy, whatever. And if I can just find that right person, they're gonna meet everything, you know, my soulmate, which is a myth, by the way. It's an absolute joke because there's no one that has everything you need and to meet every need in here. And to even try to put that pressure on them is just wrong, right? They don't have it. So it's this constant thing. And I know nobody likes to talk about it because it's depressing, right? And nobody even brings it up. You know, I had a guy tell me one time, you know, talking, I was talking to him about purpose and meaning. He says, no, I got to be real drunk before I talk about this. <laughs> Classic stuff, huh? Classic stuff. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But I do get it. Some people turn to, to a synthetic one, all right? You know, let's look. Drugs, why are, why are drugs so popular? 
Drugs are, are, are so popular, or drugs, alcohol, whatever you call, because what it does is it fills that hole and it fills it temporarily. And it's synthetic. It makes you feel a certain way that in reality you're not, right? So you feel good for a while and it's, it's addictive because, because of this hole that's in there, right? This is, it, and it, but y'all know that, that's a trap. Everybody knows that's a trap. But when you think that's all you got, I understand why people head in that direction and keep heading that direction, you know? But the trap is, is that, it, is that the hole just keeps getting bigger, right? Until it's like an appetite, you know? It's never totally satisfied. And if you overindulge, the appetite just gets bigger and then you become consumed by your own needs and appetite. Isn't that crazy how it looks? But the, but the, but the, but the problem, what Jesus is saying here is, hey, I'm gonna put the well inside you. Okay, now that sounds good, Jesus, but what does that really mean? And how does that happen? But I do want you to understand that that hole we're talking about, C.S. Lewis, Lewis called it the, soul in, uh, the hole in your soul. It's that constant gnawing that you know there's got to be something more, but you never, you never feel like you get there. And guys, the one thing I have come to realize, the cool part about, again, doing what I do, I have an opportunity to go to a lot of places and be a lot of places. I have I've been... I've, I've, I've shared God's word just kind of around everywhere. You know, I've been over to, you know, the Far East and Thailand and Laos and some of those areas, you know, and um, it's really, I've told you before, the funny part being there is, is that, you know, I just don't look Thai. <laughs> you know, I'm basically 10 inches taller than everybody else, sometimes over a foot, and I just don't fit in. But I find out being in Thailand I found out being in North Africa, I found out being in Peru, that this thing that we're talking about today is worldwide. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you have, doesn't matter how much you have, right? Is that, where do you find an answer to fill that, right? Well, this is what Jesus is talking about right now, which brings us to number three. Jesus explains so that she can understand. Now, this is huge, guys. This is my passion. I just want people to understand, right? You know, I just, I'll do most anything if I think it can help you understand because an understanding of the truth gives you, gives you a great opportunity. You may not take the opportunity, but at least you have the opportunity. If this woman never got what he was talking about, then what good is a bunch of gibberish in code that I can't understand? So Jesus lets her in on what he's talking about. And so she responds, this is what she says, sir, hey, can you give me this water so that I'll not be thirsty and I won't have to keep coming to draw water? Because she doesn't get anything that he's talking about, right? She's got this thought in her mind that, Oh, wow, yeah, hey, give me that. I won't have to keep coming here anymore, right? And then Jesus said, okay, it's time to get her in touch with her great emptiness. It's not a fun proposition, but it's until you see your need, you will never understand what Jesus is talking about here, right? And so, so here we go. Here we go. This is, this is strange, but it, it, make, it makes sense, right? Here we go. Jesus said to her, hey, listen, can you go call your husband and y'all, y'all come back here? Right? Well, this woman says, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus said to her, you're right in saying that I don't have a husband because you've had five husbands and the person you're living with now is not even your husband. Now, Jesus is a hard guy to have a conversation with because he knows it all. But the question here is, I want you to hear this, this is interesting. Right? The question here to ask is, why would Jesus even ask this? It seems non-related to everything they're talking about. Is he just trying to shame her? No, not even close. In fact, be honest, I, as I've read all through the scriptures, Jesus has never shamed anyone of their, of their sin, of their own sin. You know, only we do that, right? Seriously. 
I think what has kept more people from understanding the message of the gospel is just simple, simply shame from other people. Isn't that interesting? But it's another message for another time. But he was not trying to shame her, but he was trying to get her in touch with something. And that was her need. And what was that need? All right, well, let's take a look at it. All right, why would he say that? Well, because this woman, she was trying to fill that hole in her life with relationships with men, right? And she'd gone from one to one to one to one. Why? Because she, she knew she had emptiness and if she could just find the right guy or girl, whichever way you want to say it, if you're, if you're, a, you know, if, if you're a guy today and you feel that way, I promise you there's nobody, right? And, and the soulmate thing's a myth. I mean, you might find somebody to get along with, but I promise you they're never, why? I'm, I'm telling you the best marriages today are when both of them come into the marriage with their needs already being met, right? Because if you're, if you're needy enough to where that person's gotta come through for you, right? The worst part is that right person may try to come through for you and it just becomes a disaster, right? Why? Because they don't have what it takes. But if you already got your needs met, boy, marriage can be one incredible thing because you're freed up to meet, to serve and to meet their needs, right? That's, that is the best, you know, when you're freed up, then relationships can really grow. But if there's this constant drag and drain of neediness, it's not ever going to, see, guys, you have, understanding what the truth, and that's what he's trying to sit, get this woman to see, because with every one, it just got tasteless, right? And so, first relationship, you know, and, and, you know, well, I'm just not happy. And if I'm not happy, then, then it must not be right, right? And I'm just not fulfilled and this is not what I'm looking for. So we throw one away and we go looking for something else. But for some reason, this woman thought it had to be in a relationship, right? In a, in a marital relationship. Well, she just started going through them and I imagine it got worse every time. That's the way it always does. You see, what is Jesus? There's no shame here, right? Uh, well, there is shame here, right? But Jesus is not trying to, he's just trying to let her see, do you understand what I'm talking about? Finding that which fills the deepest empty place that's there. And let me tell you why it's there. Because regardless of what people tell you, you were created. And you were created to have a relationship with the God who created you. And that's why, because that relationship with him is the only thing that will meet that, that, that hole, right? You can try to cram other stuff into it and it will always be cool for a small amount of time, but it'll be like drinking water. You're just gonna get thirsty again, right? So there's a great, there's a great thing to learn here when you and I can learn that is worldwide, right? Everywhere you go, it's the same thing. Seriously, whether you go into an extremely poverty-stricken culture or you go into wealthy culture like ours, it's the same gnawing thing inside, right? Now, after Jesus said, hey, go call your husband, don't have one, all that stuff, this woman says, well, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. All right, well, that's classic statement there, right? Oh, that's brilliant. How'd you come up with that one on your own, right? And so... And so what does she do in verse 20? This is classic stuff, guys, still happens today. She wants to argue religion. So she launches into, which was, which was basically steeped in all of her prejudice, right? And his, in what she assumes is his prejudice, right? And this she said, well, our fathers worship on this mountain, right? We have been doing so for generations. But you say that, that is you Jewish people, y'all say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. In other words, who's right? And how do we know who's right, right? And that's the kind of stuff you hear today, right? In fact, you live in a culture today to where everybody's right. Group hug, right? Right? Everybody's right, everybody. And it's just not the truth, right? You can say that one plus one is three and you can say it's the truth, but in reality, is it, isn't it just being politically correct, right? 
So the thought here is, it's interesting. She wants to, she wants to talk about all of this other stuff and well, that's your opinion and this and this and this. But I want you to understand that Jesus never hopped on the page that there was no truth. In fact, there was a truth in, in, in this. And then Jesus looked at her and says, woman, believe me, okay? That the hour is coming when you won't worship on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem are you gonna worship the Father, right? You see, the problem you have, guys, you, you guys worship what you don't even know, is what she's saying. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. So there is a correct, there is a truth. God chose the Jewish folks, all right, down through Abraham, delivered just an incredible thing that has to do with, the, if you know the scriptures, all the way through up to who Christ is. So there is a truth, right? And there is an error, right? So he just tells her that, basically, is that basically he's saying, you worship what you don't know. In other words, you just are making it up along the way. So there is a truth to it, right? But Jesus goes on to say, look at verse 23, but the hour is coming. In fact, it's here right now. This is classic stuff that Jesus is saying. In other words, it's coming to a time where none of it matters, right? None of it matters. And he says, it's not only coming, but it's here right now. When those who are true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and that the Father looks for those people. Okay, right? now, this is classic stuff. I just want you to hear it, put it together. When you understand Jesus is comparing the two, the Samaritans' worship and the Jewish people's worship. Now, the Jewish people's worship was according to truth, but it was as dead and unexciting as a nail, right? I don't know why some people think that it has to be dead, all right, to be godly, whatever. Right? So, so the Jews had that, they, they, but they had no spirit in their worship. They had, it wasn't anything about their heart. They were just following rules and regulations, right? Didn't matter or anything else. But the Samaritans were the exact opposite. They were, it was, they were all into it. It was sincere, it came from their heart, you know? And, uh, but remember this, is that both of them is what we're talking about here, all right? You know? Well, I want to worship God in my own way. Well, you need to stop it. Right? You need to stop it. Why? Because it's not about you. It's about him. Is it not? Right? So there is correct. There is truth here. This is what Jesus is saying. I just want you to hear it. I just want you to understand it. Right? But it's coming. What is it that's coming that's changing? Why is it that there's, there's really not a big deal if you worship in Jerusalem or worship on a mountain or worship anywhere? Because it has nothing to do with the place anymore. Interesting, huh? Why? Because the place is now, right? The well is now gonna be where? Within. So it's an incredible thing when you truly understand what Jesus is talking about here, what you're looking for is found in who he is and what he came to do because of the need that is identified that all of us identify with, right? All of us identify with this. So God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And then, and then, the, then the lady responds again and she says, well, I know that the Messiah is coming, that is the Christ, right? I know that there's one coming. And when he gets there, he's gonna tell us about these things. And then Jesus, <laughs> Jesus does this very rarely because he's many times questioned and he never answers, he usually answers with another question. But in this particular case, in a rare time with this woman at the well, he looks at her and says, I'm the guy. Well, imagine the shock feeling she has, you know? And then she's faced with the dilemma of what is this, right? But for some reason, her eyes are open to it and she understands and, and, and she puts her faith and trust in him. We're not told exactly how, it, we're just alluded to it later in the passage of what she does, right? You know, it's amazing 
how God works in people's lives and that this would be the woman that he stopped with. You do realize that this woman, she was having a pretty tough life because she'd kind of been ostracized, right? Jeff, how do you know those things? Well, you know, most women at this particular time, they were the ones that, that drew water and got water to the house. Now, what time of the day do you think that most of the women in that particular area would go to the well? Early. Morning, before it got hot. Perhaps even right before the sun came up. In fact, it became usually a big gathering place. So all the ladies would come together to get water and what would happen? Anybody, anybody listening? <laughs> They'd start talking. So it became a social gathering place, which would make sense, right? Big, big coffee shop, right? And, and when did this woman come to the well to get her water? Noon, why? She wasn't accepted, right? She was forsaken by them. She was separated from everybody, right? I find it interesting that she's the very one that Jesus picked out to have a conversation with. Isn't that amazing? Again, just stuff for you to hear, stuff for you to understand. It just is kind of amazing. So anyway, number four, and this is where I'll be done. A testimony that the woman shared. Now, this is real easy because just, as the, just then the disciples came back and they marveled that Jesus was talking all right, uh, with the woman. But obviously no one was gonna say, hey, why are you talking to her, right? So the woman left her water jar. There's a lot of symbolism there, right? For those of you who have ears to hear, I don't have enough time to explain it, all right? Don't need that water jar anymore. So she leaves and she goes away into the town and she tells the people, you gotta, you gotta come and see. And therein lies responsibility that has been given to us. You'll see it in just a minute, right? She says, this has got to be him, right? I want you to come. And I want you to see the man that told me everything I ever did. I mean, this could be him. And so they all came out of the town to Christ. Now, this is, this is incredible. We're gonna skip down to verse 39 because I don't have enough time to share with it at all. But many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. In other words, they were like, wow, really? You know, but it wasn't enough. Okay, they believed that he was the Christ, but they had to understand, you know, what he came to do, right? They, they, you have to understand, guys. Without understanding, you can't trust anything because you cannot trust something you don't understand. So it says this, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and Jesus stayed with them for two days. Boy, I wish we had record of what they talked about. We don't. All we know is, is that many more believed because of his word. And then they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know, and we know that indeed, this is indeed the what? Savior of the world. So now they know what he'd come to do, right? A changed life. Now, what did this, what this woman do? I have found personally, it's incredible. Anyone who truly is his, anyone truly that's got to change life, they just want other people to know, All right? And there's not anything you can do because this woman didn't change their lives. That she just got them to the, to the one that could. And therein lies, to me, the, the greatest thing that you and I can understand of who we are and what God's called us to do, right? And, uh, and basically, it's just getting someone to hear, right? To understand. You know, I'm gonna tell you a story and then I'm done. But I, I didn't become a believer when I was 21. Uh, if you come to the dinner with the pastor, I share a lot more of this there. So if you've been to that, you've heard parts of this. But I grew up going to church. If anything, I was a religious kid because I went all the time, all right? In Tennessee, the Bible Belt, I mean, you're gonna go to church. Church is just something you, you, you just go to. It, 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 was, it was cultural, right? There was almost this cultural pressure for you to go, so everybody went. It didn't mean everybody was a believer, but they all went. And so I did all the stuff the church told me to do, right? I went to the classes, I went to the, you know, I was baptized, I, went, I did all of those things. 
then some real bad things happened in the, in the, in the midst of that church. And it really soured me on the whole thing, right? I said, I don't want any part of this. And, and I didn't, I kind of walked away from it all. Uh, and that's why I was still, you know, still in high school. And, uh, and, and I just, as you think on these, I just want you to hear it, is that, that if it's only religious, people will start to squabble and fight with one another. If it's a group of people that he is actually within, there will be unity there. Why? Because we're all his. When it's religious, everybody has a different opinion. Right? I mean, if you're religious, remember, what'd you know? If, you, if you're supposed to do it once, no, you can be doubly good if you do it twice. It always makes a mess, right? But so anyway, so I, I never got, I got the religious part, but I never got the message, right? And so I immersed myself in, uh, in, in playing sports. Guys, I found that everybody is looking for something to fill that place. Well, for me, it became part of this team and a sport. Football was what it was. And that's, I threw my entire self into it. Having no idea that if your whole life is about something like that, it's not gonna last that long, right? You're talking about heading to a major life crisis. If you put in all of your eggs in the basket of anything that is temporary, you're cruising for a bruising. Because anything temporary obviously is not gonna last. And when it's gone, you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit a traumatic experience. Well, three surgeries later, right? I couldn't play anymore. You know, when I was in high school, there was this one particular girl, she used to talk to me about the things. She walked with me five minutes a day, you know, between classes. We never did anything else together, just that five minutes. And, and she used to talk about Christ as if she had a relationship with him. She got it. She understood it. We would have all told you we were Christians. Why? Because we all did the religious thing, but we didn't, you know, we knew, we knew about Christ. We knew about the cross, but it was never within, right? And so, but she was different and she used to talk about it. It was amazing. And I remember after I, I, had, I couldn't play anymore, I went back home for the holidays and somebody invited me to a Christmas program. All right, guys, the reason that the Christmas program, y'all know me, I'm not a music guy, right? You have a tone deaf pastor, all right? I mean, all of my family loves music. I just don't get it. I don't understand it. And yet I find it ironic. Somebody invited me to go to a Christmas musical and I said, I said I would go. Why? That's why our Christmas musical is so, such a big deal to me because I don't know why. If anybody had invited me to come to anything else, I would have said no. But something about Christmas, Y'all know what I'm talking about? Something about Christmas, you'll do something you wouldn't normally do. And so I show up and at this little Christmas musical, well, in little, it was huge. And I look up in the program and there was the girl from high school. I connected with her after it was over and she invited me to her church and I heard the message for the first time. Guys, and then it wasn't a few months later, I became a believer and then the rest is, is history. And so, this girl from high school, right? Did she have anything, all right? Did she change my life? No. She just got me to the person that could. That is you and I's responsibility, and that's it. I want you to know that the most loving thing, if you're truly his today, if you're a follower, the most loving thing you can do for someone is to bring them, bring them to Christ. Let them at least hear. After that, it's their responsibility. There's nothing else you can do, right? but you can bring them, right? You can bring them. That became the incredible picture of what he's called us to do. So as I close today, right? As I close today, this is what's coming up, you know? Uh, you know, if you, if you have folks in your life, uh, there's a Christmas musical coming, I'm promising you. Uh, I know personally, because I remember where my brain was at the time. And if something about it, oh well, yeah, I'll go, you know? And uh, it's an incredible thing because you and I's responsibility is just, is people just to hear, right? And that is incredible to think about. If you're not real, real sure where if you're a believer here today, then understand the message is clear about who Christ is and what he came to do and the difference it makes in a person's life. It's not a religion you follow, right? It's a difference he makes within. It is a powerful thing when you understand, right? When you understand and understand what it means to put your faith and trust in him, all right?